Hi, this is David Orlovsky, and this is the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Woo! And you are joining me for the special USA edition of the Rabbi Orlovsky Show because I am in the United States of America, hence the USA. Now, Hayaksat um, Fashla. You there, Mazef Fashla? This is Hebrew. Yeah, I have been living in Israel for 30 years, so I've picked up a few fancy words like fashla and many other Hebrew words like informatia and telephone and optimisti. Anyway, but uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, we had a little fashla that, you know, we usually record uh, during the week when I'm making a trip, we record in advance, and uh, uh, we didn't record way in advance. So we were going to record when I got back to Israel. I was supposed to get back to Israel this past Monday, and uh, so it wouldn't have come out on Motzi Shabbos. The one for Parshas Pagu, they would have come out a little uh, later than that. However, um, as it happens, my daughter... Um, had to uh, have a cesarean um, three weeks before her due date. Not taking into account how this would affect the podcast. <laughs> I tried to explain it to her, but go figure. She and her doctor don't have that same sense of dedication <laughs> that everyone who watches this show has. So uh, I had to extend my ticket. Um, I won't be back until when this comes out. It'll be later on in that, that week. And, uh, and so I missed a week. Okay, I mean, we did, we did over 20 of these without any problem, you know, but, uh, but now uh, we actually missed a week. And a number of people said to me, what happened to uh, the podcast? And I assured them that I would give them their money back. So if you're also one of the people who feel that you paid for this podcast <laughs> and didn't get your money's worth, please write me and I will send you back as much as you sent me. <laughs> In fact, I'll send you back double. Now, those Weisenheimers who actually sponsored this episode, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> this episode is a sponsored, as they have been, Baruch Hashem, uh, the rallying cry. Uh, to the community. And this one is dedicated as a schus for the donors. That's it. That's all they said. And he said, please don't share any of my details. For example, <laughs> let's call him Yossi. His name actually is Yossi. But I'm just kidding. He didn't even put down his name. I don't know his name. But he said something which is interesting because I've gotten a number of other uh, emails like this, where there are people who say, for whatever reason, I don't learn during the week. I don't learn during the week. I should, but I don't. And your podcast is the only Torah learning I have during the week. And my first reaction was, Nabuch. <laughs> and he says, no, because you don't understand. He says, you know, everything is so heavy. I've been giving a share in Harnof uh, for over 20 years. And, um, and uh, I've asked people over the years why they come. There are different answers why people come to this particular share. But one of the answers I get is because it's one of the only places I go to where I come out feeling good that I'm a from Jew. And that says it all. Can I tell you something? That says it all. That's what I want more than anything is that people are watching this walk away and say the fact that I'm correct. Now, I got an email from somebody who decided to go on Torah anytime, not Jewish, and at random happened to come in when I put up my first podcast and has been following my podcast religiously, I assume. Um, not Jewish religiously, <laughs> or whatever, because fascinated about Judaism. Now, you can only imagine what a skewed perception of Judaism this person is getting if their entire understanding is just the Rabbi Orlovsky show. But uh, I encourage them to go and watch some of the actual rabbis 
um, who are on tour any time. But uh, it's amazing how many people contact me and say that this podcast is what carries them through the week, what gives them the chizik, what gives them uh, the amazement. So I, I really apologize for the fact that I, uh, that I didn't, uh, weren't able to do this. We missed a week. But, uh, but the fact that the fellow who's sponsoring it this week is because he appreciates for himself and for these other people that the role that this podcast plays for so many people. And what a schus it is for me to be able to have this opportunity. You know, uh, I meet from people who say to me, I don't think God cares if I live or die. And I always tell them, make no mistake about it. He has no shortage of ways of getting rid of you. And if you're still here, it's because he wants you here. And, uh, and that's always eye-opening. They thought maybe God just forgot about them. You know? Somebody once said, if you think nobody cares if you live or die, try missing a few payments. You know? And you'll be surprised how quickly people think about you. <laughs> but uh, we have a lot to catch up on. We, ah, gosh. It's amazing. I just missed one podcast. It's only half an hour. And there's so many things I need to take care of. Somebody wrote me and said that their children like it when the podcast comes out. They play it on their way to school. And this is what they listen to. Now, this is understandable because that's more or less the age that I'm shooting at. <laughs> and he says, my four-year-old really enjoys it. But I think she thinks that your Uncle Moishi. Now, I'm not. I want to go on record for that. This is not Uncle Maishi. Uncle Maishi on the tapes is actually Zale Newman, who I worked with in NCS wife from Toronto. The public figure, uh, the person who looks like Uncle Maishi, is, is not. But, you know, Uncle Maishi definitely has played a pivotal role in the lives of so many Jews. Yeah. And uh, it was one of the the best lines I remember from a tape. I don't know why. This made such an impression on me, and I repeat it all the time. Yeah? And there's been a lot of brilliant lines. Um, there are some absolutely brilliant lines in the Marvelous Mido Machine tapes, which um, I had this chus of uh, knowing, I mentioned this in an earlier podcast, knowing A.B. Rottenberg, and... Uh, he, I have to tell you, first of all, his rhymes are so magnificent, if you listen to his lyrics, because it's, it's difficult to write English lyrics that capture what you're trying to say without also butchering English, and his, his are so seamless. But he's had some unbelievable lines in, in a lot of his different, uh, different shows. In fact, somebody else wrote me, I got so much to catch up on, somebody else wrote me, how come you stopped doing the birthday messages? So, um, in fact, A.B. Rottenberg was one of the people who sent me a birthday message. And uh, uh, so I, I just want to play that for you now, just so that everybody gets to see the birthday message. Tov to you, Reb David, on such a momentous occasion. Uh, your daughter asked me if I would send you a, a video message. It's my pleasure to do so. I fondly remember a time back in L.A. when Mama, she was like a malach from Shemayim who came and helped me in my work to set up the school in the middle of the year. And um, I've watched uh, from a distance your career and uh, very, very proud of your accomplishments and Avot Zestaira and Kira Vrachaikim and Kala Kavot to you. Anyway, with fond best wishes uh, on this momentous occasion. And happy birthday, I'm long past that. But anyway, enjoy, enjoy with your wonderful family. All the best. So he had some actual feelings. Um, I think, uh, you know, when the uh, uh, when Zaidi was young and, and all those tapes, uh, Shmuel Kunda, I think he also had some brilliant lines. Of brilliant things. But I don't know why, you know, in the first Uncle Moishi, he, uh, he had this theme song. Hey, dum, diddle, dee, dum, with a hey, dum, diddle, dee, dum. Uncle Moishi's back in town with a hey, dum, diddle, dee, dum. Now, okay, that's, 
That's all right. But in the second one, Uncle Moishi and the Mitzvah men were going to Eretz When they go to check in, the guy at the desk goes, are you Uncle Moishi who, t- who teaches Jewish children all about Torah and mitzvahs? He goes, yes, I am. Well, hey, dumb diddle dee dum <laughs> I don't know why that line has made a deeper impression on me than almost any other line in all of uh, recent Jewish life. Well, hey, dumb diddle dee dumb. I don't know, there's something about it. You know, I've, I often say that to people when they'll say something to me. They'll say whatever it is, and I go, well, hey, dumb diddle dee dumb. <laughs> so, for the four year olds out there, this is your Uncle Mighty Minute. So we want to thank this week's sponsor, and whether you're watching on Torah Anytime, my good friends at Torah Anytime, uh, or uh, wherever you're listening or watching podcasts, uh, I want to welcome you to this episode. And, uh, and there is a missing episode when they go through. One of those episodes won't be there. Anyway, so... Uh, Okay, so uh, what, are we, what are we going to talk about? So uh, this week that's coming up is, uh, of course, Parsha Zohar. Parsha Zohar. And there is a mitzvah to remember to forget a Amalek. <laughs> yeah, Zohar, yeah, and Timcha Zecha Amalek. <laughs> the mitzvah is to remember to forget. Yeah? Remembering is an amazing thing. Memory. Yeah? Uh, when I was younger, I could memorize entire Broadway shows. That's how I was growing up. You know, obviously, I, uh, I wasn't uh, in an atmosphere where we were memorizing the Schneis. Yeah? But... Uh, but uh, the the things that I that I remember from, from my youth is is, uh, is just scary how much worthless information I have. <laughs> I remember you once said, Rolovsky, if only you could learn to use your mind for good instead of evil. Imagine what you could accomplish." Yeah? But um, but it's amazing how many things you remember. I don't know if he once had mentioned. He's I don't know if he ever said it publicly, but he said it to me privately. You know, he's a master mechanic, very well known. Um, and he said, my, my wife woke me up in the middle of the night because I was reciting the presidents by heart. Which, you know, you learn something like that and, and it stays with you. Yeah. Um, I not only have memorized all the presidents, I also know who they defeated in every election. Now, if that's not a wellspring of worthless information, I don't know what is. But it's one of the many things that I have chosen to fill my head with. So I don't have, like, um, you know, all of my uh, grandchildren's names, for example, which I don't have any room left, you know. <laughs> I have to get an external disc. But, uh, but people say, you know, oh, but you know all of your children's birthdays. And I say, yes, I do, because most, certainly my early children, they, uh, they were all born before or after. That's how it worked. My first daughter was born on Gimel Iyar, which is the day before Yom HaZikaron. And the English birthday was April 16th, which is the day after the income tax filing day. My second daughter was born on second day of Shavuos. Um, my uh, son was born Motzi Shabbos Nachamu. We were at a Shabbaton, actually. Um, the, uh, my next daughter was born January 1st, day after, well, the first day of the new year. And she was born on the 11th of Teves, the day after Asar Teves. My next two children, I couldn't figure out until they were both born, because one was born on November 24th, and one was born on November 26th. So one was born before November 25th, and one after November 25th. Um, it goes on like this. It's really fascinating. Um, so, uh, as mnemonic device does. But then you start to get older. Now, part of it is you get old and your memory starts to go. Part of it is genetic. My father 
last 20 years of his life, most people's names were, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, 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 you know, the guy. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I picked that up, you know. Because when you get old, the first thing to go is your memory. Second thing is, um, that's not important. But, uh, but you can take courses. This guy tells his friend, he says, you know, I, I took a course to be able to remember uh, things. He says, really, how does it work? He goes, well, you make a mental picture of what you're trying to remember. He says, give me an example. He says, all right, well, ask me something. He says, all right, you went out to eat last night with your wife. Where did you go? He says, okay, watch this. A flower, it's, it's a red flower, a long green stem, you know, like on Mother's Day. Rose, right. Rose, where did we go to eat last night? <laughs> That's, uh, that's one way. But anyway, um, so, so there's, a, there's a thing about memory, and this is the point that I really wanted to talk about because on this past trip, I was first in America for two weeks before I extended my ticket. I spoke in the uh, University of Milwaukee for a major, wonderful organization, um, and Rabbi Tversky Shul. And in fact, I didn't realize this until the end, but someone had put on my stand of the Rabbi Olavsky show and made a sign and they put it on a tilt. <laughs> One of my active listeners, yeah. Um, and I got to do uh, uh, a shul, I got to do a, uh, uh, a Shabbos. I spoke Friday night uh, by, by the, the Shiner Shul in Muncie, or uh, Chaim, which is just an event. Just that whole institution is unbelievable. Um, last week I did a Shabbos for Rabbi Badman Shul. Um, also unbelievable. These are people who just started institutions to be able to provide services, which is which is amazing. And uh, I spoke in Boca Raton for uh, uh, a beautiful Kirib organization called the JEC down in Boca Raton, doing wonderful, wonderful work. And uh, and it was just. Uh, um, I had such an opportunity. I spoke um, in uh, Or Yitzchak, uh, Rabbi Wallerstein, uh, Pinchas Wallerstein, another individual who just is so Shem Shemayim. I mean, I just, this has been such an inspiring trip for me. But at one point, somebody comes over and says, you know, I always say over what you say in a shir. And uh, he said over something, and I said, no, no, that's not how it goes. I know because I've been saying this same story for 35 years. And they said, no, 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 that's how you say it. I said, no, <laughs> that's not the way I say it. He says, I remember. And that was so interesting because he does remember. He remembers what I said. It's just not what I said. Because memory is a tricky thing. We remember very well things that were never said. Events that never happened. I'll give you an example. There was a senator called Paul Simon, and uh, he was running for president. And uh, it was a crowded presidential field. He was a Democrat. And at one point, he mentioned that he graduated first in his law school. And it came out that he didn't, I don't know if he was 12th, whatever it was, he wasn't first. And there was an op ed in the New York Times that said, I remember catching the winning touchdown in the football game. Now, it could be I didn't, <laughs> but I remember it. I remember it happening. This fellow remembered me saying this thing. Paul Simon remembered graduating first in his class. Memory is such a tricky thing. Um, I'll give you an example. Deborah Lipstadt uh, is a historian who's been working very hard to counter Holocaust denial, which is a phenomenon. People deny the Holocaust. Even though there's such a wealth of information and it's uh, so powerful, but people deny it. So, um, so I, 
Rabbi Mati Berger from Eshet Torah, he, he used to, sometimes in the class, he'd say, what can we do to preserve the memory of the Holocaust? People said, write down the accounts. Uh, people said, um, make people say it every day to remember it. He said, uh, people said, make a holiday. Yom HaZikaron. Some, uh, Yom HaShoah. Something so that we can remember it, celebrate it with, with whatever rituals you create. Now, this was a non-observant group of people. He says, you know, you've all given excellent ideas of how to preserve a historical event, even though in time it might be forgotten, there won't be anybody who was there. But we've already always said that the Jewish people stood at Mount Sinai and received the Torah and heard God himself speak. Now imagine they sat down and asked the same questions that I just asked you. What's going to happen when there's no more people alive from Matan Torah, from the giving of the Torah, and there's nobody around? How are we going to preserve this? Well, we can make a holiday like Shavuos. We can make people say it every day. Zohar as Yom Seiz Chameret, that's right. Ko Yimei Chayecha. Have a Seder, come up with uh, different uh, rituals. Zeichli Yitzias Mitzrayim. And the people were always uncomfortable with this. Because people want to remember what they want to remember. Man sees what he wants to see and disregards the rest. La 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 la. That's for the person who asked me, how could I quote Jackie Mason? And I didn't have to answer because they answered themselves. He pulls out the seeds of the Ramon and throws away the husk of the pomegranate. Yeah. Uh, when, when, there's, when there's wisdom, there's a good line. I'll take it from anybody, from any place. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing thing today where we decide that this person is not a good person and therefore all of their contributions are are gone. It's a mistake, I think. Uh, you can look... Could you imagine if somebody comes up with a cure for cancer then it turns out that he's a miserable human being, so what are you going to do? Not use his, his cure? Because he himself is a miserable person? Totally different uh, subject, but this came up recently. Um... People say, I went to this rabbi and he was really mean, or he said bad things to me, or he said the wrong things to me, or whatever it is. Now I don't want to be religious. I went to doctors who were just incredibly incompetent, which is amazingly incompetent. And I went to other people who were just really not nice people. You know, they talk about having a bedside manner, you know what I mean? But uh, it was beyond that. Just just really unpleasant people. And, uh, and uh, that doesn't mean I turn my back on modern medicine just because there are people like that in the field. So I'm going to do go to a witch doctor instead, you know, because I don't like these doctors. So yeah, yeah, there are rabbis who are incompetent. And there are rabbis who are not nice people. And uh, that's unfortunate. But uh, we don't throw away the Torah because of that. Well, these people are in Torah, and so they might, oh, so what? So doctors take a Hippocratic oath. You know, they're supposed to be nicer people, but they're not. So what? You know, you're, you're looking for expertise. You're looking for people to know what they're doing. How many people are going to be able to maintain the moral standards and the intellectual standards, uh, the rigorous standards to be able to be the people they're supposed to be? So, uh, listen, when I w was going through my own personal quest, I would have a question. I'd go to a rabbi, give me an answer. And the answer didn't make any sense. And I would press them a little bit, and they would get angry or hostile. And I would very politely um, move away from that situation and find a different rabbi. And suddenly I had to go through a few rabbis until I found someone who said something that made sense to me. Well, that's Okay. I didn't expect everybody to be an expert. The Brevda told the story where he had this terrible pain. I went to a doctor and he ran all the tests and they said, there's nothing wrong with you. So he continued living with the pain. He couldn't take it anymore. 
and he went to another doctor. And uh, that doctor did all the same tests. He said, there's nothing wrong with you. And then he looked at the rabbi and he says, but you know what? Something tells me you're not going to believe me because you know you're in pain. So you go to a third doctor and maybe that third doctor will find something. And he says, v'kachoyah. He did the other test and he managed to see a shadow of some kind of a stone on the back of my kidney that everybody else had missed. He only saw the shadow. He was able to treat it. So, uh, so therefore what? Because the first two doctors told him he wasn't in pain, therefore he wasn't in pain, and he, therefore he gave up going to a third doctor. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? But when it, when it comes to remembering things, yeah, remember what Amalek did. Memory is, is a tricky thing. And you have to work hard to stay focused. You have to work hard to remember what it is that I'm trying to say, what it is I'm trying to accomplish. <sighs> we come to Parashat Zohar, and it's very important because was it Winston Churchill? I don't know. You can Google it today. You don't have to... But uh, the quote is, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And it's true. You find situations that take place over and over again. And there are people who in their own lives make the same mistakes over and over again. And they always feel bad about it. I had a Talmud at the end of a year. He did not maximize his year. Let's put it nicely. At the end of the year, he was literally in tears, and he says, Rebbe, I did it again. I said, this year would be different. I said, this year I'm going to really change. This year I'm going to really accomplish anything. And I didn't do anything. And it's very sad. I don't know what to tell him. Yeah, that's true. You really did waste your year. <laughs> but what are you going to do? You try again. You pick yourself up and you try again. What are you going to do? But... Uh, but people, people have, have memories. The memories slip away. Do you remember? Look, what's, what's, the, what's the biggest example? We come down into this world, and we know why we're in this world. We're here to do Torah and mitzvahs. We're here to perfect ourselves. We're here to make the world a better place. We're here to do something. And instead, we don't do anything. We waste our time away. And that's the explanation many people give about Gehenna. Gehenna is not fire, obviously. Your soul, you can't burn a soul. Yeah? If you don't believe me, save up your money and invest in cyrogenics. They'll wrap you in aluminum foil and put you in the freezer. You, you know, don't have to worry. It's worse than that. Because <laughs> burning is an example of shame. And you'll get to the Olam HaEmes and you'll remember what I was trying to do. And you'll watch your whole life and then you'll watch what your life could have been. You could be great and noble instead of small and petty. So I'm going to live up to what my Rebbe told me. Everybody, you know, everybody in this world has a purpose. Yours is to be a bad example. <laughs> I tell the story. I'm not proud of the story. I, I, I tell you. Even though I was right. <laughs> but there was evidently a tombstone where they wrote, Heal lives Jonathan Wright. Um, uh, he went through the intersection. Because the light was green, even though there was another car coming. He was right. But he's just as dead as if he'd been wrong. <laughs> but being right isn't the most important thing. Yeah. There was a guy who came collecting. Sholon Harnov. And lifted up his trouser leg and he showed that he, his leg was shrunk from polio. He says, I have an operation tomorrow morning. And uh, I have to 
raise the money to pay for the blood transfusion. I need two pints of blood. Each one is a hundred shekel. I mean, what a story. I saw people t- pull out 200 shekels on the spot and give it to him. The next night he was back again. Lifted up his trouser leg. Have an operation tomorrow morning. Yeah. I began to suspect that this story was not true. <laughs> now if he says, listen, I have polio and I'm collecting money because you know I can't work, whatever it is, I would have given him money. But this was a scam. Now obviously he made a lot more money through the scam. And then I would see him show up in different shuls, different places. And he was always telling the same story. And it got me so upset because the guy's a liar. And, and, and he's taking advantage of people's good nature. Maybe that's the Pinchas in me. You know, I'm a Kohen, you know. You see something wrong, you know, your first reaction is to pick up a spear, you know. Okay, I don't know. But it really bothered me, it bothered me. Anyway, I come out of a class in Ur Sameach. And there are a lot of the Talmudim around. And there he is. And he turns to me, in front of the students, and he lifts up his trouser leg. And he says, um, I have an operation tomorrow morning in Hadassah. I need two pints of blood. And I'm raising the money to be able to buy two pints of blood. It's a hundred shekels these pints of blood. I said, you have a health plan that's covering the hospital and the operation and the anesthesiologist, the surgeon, and it doesn't include the blood? That's outrageous. I know somebody in the Ministry of Health. I'll call them right now. Who's your health plan? No, it's too late, too late. The operation is tomorrow. It can't be done. I need the money. I said, no problem. I'll donate the blood. He said, what? I said, you have an operation tomorrow morning. You need two pints of blood. I'll give you the blood. Says, One person can't give that much blood. So I turned to the Talmidim and said, is anybody here willing to donate a pint of blood to this poor man so that he doesn't have to walk around the day before his operation collecting money for his own blood transfusion? And all the hands went up. I said, we'll get you as much blood as you need. He says, no, it's too early in the morning. And I turned to the Talmud and I said, how many people would be willing to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to go to the hospital and donate a pint of blood to this poor man so he could go home now and get a good night's sleep before his operation tomorrow? And all the hands shot up. And evidently he had never had this experience before. <laughs> and he said to me, are you going to be money? I said, why? It's for the blood. I'll give you the blood. Just then, Rav Bulman Zatzal walked by, put a coin in the man's hand, looked at me and said, Rav David, what you're doing is not worth five shekels, and walked away. Now, very often when I tell this story over, people say, but you were right. But you were right. He's a scam artist. And I said, you're right. So how come whenever I tell over the story, I wish I was Rabbi Bowman? (laughs) How come I wish that I was the the rabbi that came over, gave the cool line, handed a coin to this guy who was obviously a scam artist and walked away, making the other guy, me, feel like garbage? (laughs) Why? Because being right is not the most important thing. And when you try to remember... What is so important to you? People forget. You find this in marriages all the time. People get involved in such stupid arguments. Oh, this and that. You said this, you said that. You went here with that. Who cares? At the end of the day, people get into into so many conflicts, so many things. Got to be right. Got to be right. That's what happens because, you know, now, there are people who have, I always pronounce it wrong, endemic memory, uh, a memory where they can't forget anything. These people have a very difficult time in life because Shekha was created for us to be able to move on. You've got to move on. You've got to forget. The problem with, for, uh, they say if a woman remembered the pain of childbirth, she'd never, she'd never get pregnant again. You have to forget. 
If there's no trauma, you have a trauma and you don't forget. Yaakov Avinu, right? Didn't, didn't forget about Yosef because he wasn't really dead. And so for 22 years, he didn't have Ruach HaKadosh because he couldn't put it behind him. Forgetting is a gift. But if we forget the important things, then it's a tragedy. It's Shabbos Zohar. We have to remember what Amalek did to us and remember why that's such a terrible thing. And then we can fight them on Purim. But if we don't remember, then we can't fight them. So that's it for this week. Um, if you would like to contact me, you can go to rabielowski.com slash contact. Uh, if you want to make a uh, uh, comment uh, on this podcast, uh, uh, it's uh, rabielowski.com slash podcast slash 22, I think. Um, if you want to find about upcoming events, go to rabielowski.com slash events. And if you'd like to sponsor an episode, uh, you go to rabbiolowski.com slash uh, podcast and click on the sponsor button. That's it for this week. Uh, I appreciate you watching and listening. This is Rabbi Olowski. This is the Rabbi Olowski Show. <music>